Yeah. Okay. Uh, my my, my um, yes. colleague is just uploading the presentation. Yes, we see the presentation. Okay, that's perfect. Should I start then? Or? Yes, please. Okay, perfect. Okay, yeah, my name uh, already mentioned is Daniel Otto. I'm from the so-called Learning Lab at the University of Duisburg-Essen in Germany. And I'm here with my colleagues, Daniel Dietmann and Nadine Schröder. And we're all part of a research project we are currently doing at uh, the Learning Lab, which is uh, dedicated uh, to OER and um, especially to a federal infrastructure concerning OER. And, and when we started this research project, we were very much interested in um, becoming a good overview about what is actually the status of the research um, about OER. And we were not so much interested in um, research on a conceptual or theoretical level. We were more interested on what's really there in empirical terms. So what are really what is really the status of uh, the empirical studies that are done all over the world and that are published in um, academic journals. And uh, this is why we started um, to, uh, to establish a so-called uh, mapping of this empirical research by using um, a systematic mapping approach. My colleague will uh, tell you more about how we actually, uh, how we actually accomplished that. And um, if you go to the next slide, we can um, just see that we were gu guided by three major um, questions for our systematic mapping. First of all, we wanted to know um, in empirical terms, what are the uh, predominant um, thematic focuses of our OER research? So uh, what is the research really concentrated on? The second quest question was, um, which are the research methods that are used in these studies? For example, the surveys or interpretation of data or uh, qualitative studies. So that was also um, in our interest. Uh, the third aspect was um, the prevalence, because we've done this worldwide, the prevalence um, of the studies um, concerning the educational sectors, for example, were there many studies in the sector of school, higher education, vocational education, and also the question in which countries is, um, yeah, which countries do most research, empirical research on OER? Yes, so this was um, where we started and my, my colleague Nadine, which I'm going to hand over, is tell you, will tell you more about um, how we done this on a methodological basis. Yes, I give you uh, an insight into our method methodological procedure. Um, we followed a systematic mapping approach to present the empirical studies on OER as complete as possible. Um, but it's not an in-depth analysis, but an overview of the literature and certain on certain topics um, yeah, to identify trends and gaps in the OER research landscape. Mm. As criteria for searching relevant publications, we defined First of all, publications of the last five years um, to reflect most current studies and uh, peer reviewed journal articles in English uh, to get an international perspective. Um, with uh, these limitations, we searched Web of Science, Scopus, and ERIC using the keyword open educational resources across uh, all fields. Um, after reducing duplicates, we got a search results of 550 publications. And uh, these were part of our first screening process. Um, and there we excluded publications which either didn't represent empirical studies or um, where the primary focus was not OER. So finally, uh, we got 272 publications, which we included into a detailed analysis. And um, we defined, uh, we assigned these studies to categories on the basis of a category scheme. On the scheme we developed um, and validated collaboratively. And these categories include both formal and content related levels. Um, and based on these categories, we evaluated the frequencies to get a systematic map. 
So uh, in the following, uh, we would like to present some selected findings. Um, the distribution of the studies by continents show um, that more than a third of the studies are located in North America, especially USA. And uh, studies from Europe and Asia follow. And in contrast, um, studies from South America and Africa are less represented. And uh, 14, for 14 publications, no clear position could be identified and 21 studies were conducted on more than one continent. Um, next one, please. <laughs> Thank you, Nadine. Uh, no. I'll, ah, no, no, it's your turn, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm not yet. Um, so uh, the educational area in which the studies were um, conducted um, show the higher education sector as predominant with more than 70% followed by the school sector. And um, cross-educational research um, could be included in about 13% of the studies. And um, so we can say it plays a quite important role as well. So now it's your turn, Daniel, to continue with further results. Okay, Nadine, now I can uh, say thank you. Uh, yeah, first I'd like to show you uh, what research methods were used in our, IP, in our empirical studies. Uh, the figure you can see here reveals that uh, quantitative method methods are look, uh, can be located at the highest level with just under um, yeah 63%, while qualitative methods account for a relatively small share of 20% and are at a similar level um, to mixed method approaches with a share of 70%. And when we have a deeper look in, at the methods, it becomes clear that the quantitative areas uh, area um, consists uh, mainly of surveys and data analysis, um, and that interviews and in interpretative studies predominate the qualitative studies. Um, Another really important category for us is called uh, research focus. In this category, it was possible for us within the mapping process to classify studies into more than just one subcategory. You can see uh, the subcategories here um, because, because within individual studies, we could often identify uh, several goals and research interests. And uh, in this category, it's very interesting that almost 30% of the studies could be assigned um, to the category use adoption. And this um, subcategory contains studies that talk about the use of OER uh, in learning contexts, for example, about the creation, the adaption, and the sharing um, of materials within learning contexts. Uh, another, another big subcategory is uh, the category uh, perception and attitude, which applied about 18% of our studies uh, we examined. In this category, very often uh, the teacher attitude, or the teacher's attitude towards OER and their uh, perception of OER were surveyed. And uh, further, furthermore, one interesting uh, outcome is uh, almost 12% of the studies could be assigned uh, to a category called learning outcomes. Um, these studies often compared the extent uh, to which learning outcomes that were achieved with OER differed from learning outcomes based on uh, the use of conventional uh, teaching materials. And in this context, we found several, uh, several, several studies, especially from the US American U U region, um, that are worth mentioning, mentioning because um, they uh, all investigate the use of open textbooks and their comparative cost advantages compared to uh, classical educational materials. And uh, this research focus seems to be understandable against, uh, well, for us, was understandable against the background that in contrast, for example, to Germany, where the prices uh, for educational materials are uh, moderate or low, OERs are often used in many countries to reduce uh, the costs of education, especially in the USA, such studies can be located with a focus on the university context. Mm. Furthermore, 11% um, of the studies could be assigned to the category effectiveness. Here, uh, the focus is not on um, effectiveness in terms of learning outcomes, but on aspects uh, such as cost or time efficiency. 
And uh, a last um, yeah, interesting aspect I want to mention right now can be seen when looking at the categories uh, technical infrastructure or strategy. Um, this uh, includes um, studies that focus on strategic aspects. Uh, it's therefore not only uh, mainly a question of um, how OERs are created or perceived, rather the focus of um, yeah, this type of study is how the environments and requirements for this are created on a structural level or how systematic implementation strategies um, or policies are developed or implemented, taking into account not only learners and teachers on an individual level, but also other actors uh, such as technical support, libraries, non-teaching staff. Another category of our systematic um, mapping, systematic mapping uh, consists in the main contribution of the studies. And uh, interesting results can also be seen uh, when looking on this um, yeah, category, uh, which you can see in this figure, because the figure clearly shows that the majority of the studies we investigated, almost 80% are focused on the evaluation of uh, implemented OER projects, uh, measures or interventions. And in contrast, there are hardly any contributions that intend to develop uh, concrete action recommendations, uh, for example, for teachers for dealing with OER. Um, or that contribute uh, to the development or theory building um, for OER or, um, or have uh, several uh, implementation strategies, you can say. And that's um, a point that uh, will lead us to the conclusions. And that's something that Daniel Otto again will talk about now. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for this uh, fast ride through all of our data. I mean, we were only able to show uh, some aspects of the data. And if you have more questions, um, you can of course ask or post them into the chat um, because there was also a question about scientific disciplines. And I think we offer also have some findings about that. But um, first of all, I mean, we try to uh, provide a basis which could uh, serve as an maybe agenda or which could uh, deliver some points uh, for future empirical research. And as already mentioned by uh, Daniel and Nadine, um, what we can see is um, that most of the studies um, hardly um, can be uh, or there can be hardly seen any theoretical foundations of many study designs and uh, this is something that is um, in particular true for our scientific discipline um, which is um, technology based learning so most of the of the studies are, are survey based so they're sometimes reflecting personal experience of the courses uh, course that um, was done, but there's hardly any theoretical basis. So uh, to uh, go uh, through this data is more or less often um, surveys that have been um, that have been done on a classical level. And this is um, a bit unfortunate because um, this hinders a bit uh, more systematic and validating findings of various studies. Uh, for example, concentrating just on the replication, for example, of one study. Um, from another research, a researcher. And um, also um, it's, uh, it's uh, complicated to identify kind of explanatory variables um, that, we could, um, that we could identify, um, for example, for the adoption of OER or for the use of OER that would be um, also interesting. Another field um, we can um, see um, where research is needed is um, the usability and user friendliness of OER repositories. And I think um, a lot of repositories are set up all over um, the world. So it would be very desirable to know uh, more about that, how we can increase um, the usability of this repository so that uh, individuals can download or upload material. Um, another um, last aspect um, I would like to mention, I guess there are a lot of, of different aspects that we could consider, um, is especially the effects of the use uh, of OER on pedagogical um, approaches. And I, I think this is especially uh, important for concepts such, such as open pedagogy and also and the effects on established, uh, established educational practices. So we're talking about open educational practices where there's um, an intensive debate on a conceptual level, but we find few 
um, empirical studies that test uh, these assumptions about OEP or OP. And I think this would also be um, desirable. I think um, there are some, some studies uh, which came up last year, maybe next year, but these are only a few compared to all the other um, studies we have um, so far. Okay, I, I think that's it. Um, there was about 15 minutes. We were uh, <laughs> comparatively fast because we wanted that to is very to good. Take some questions or comments. Um, yeah, we have like one, uh, one question from Yan Wang, uh, who asked uh, if you see any differences in um, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm... Uh, in the scientific disciplines? Yes. Uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe um, Nadine or Daniel can say something about that. Uh, I think uh, that's something that has yet to, to uh, be to investigate it. Uh, so uh, right, um, right now we just um, yeah, um, prepared the categories we showed you now and some others, but we didn't, um, until now, we didn't um, go deeper and uh, um, look whether we could see differences between uh, the, the education sectors or the disciplines. That, that, that's something um, yeah, we can, we, we have to, and we will do in the future, but not, not right now. Do we? Daniel, but but, but we, 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 can, we can maybe state that none of the scientific disciplines are uh, predominant. So uh, we can see that uh, most of the studies are doing cross-educational, a, si a significant amount of the studies. Uh, yeah, you can see that here. So this is, uh, oh yeah, is there really not a topic which can be assigned to one single discipline? So uh, often there is no discipline mentioned or um, they have been done um, across disciplines. And you can say that we have uh, thanks uh, <laughs> uh, for the slide. We have like 24% of humanities and social science. Um, that might be um, because educational science is in it, but yeah. And we have another interesting question from Joshua. Uh, I've been thinking about how one could compare the effectiveness of commercial material with OER when much of the commercial material is found by students on the web. Do you have any ideas about that, uh, Daniel? Um, you mean to contrast uh, like a conventional yes. material with OER material? Yeah, I think this is a focus we often find in those studies because a lot of, of, um, of studies concentrate, um, especially on this question, for example, open textbooks. So uh, there's always the question, can you have the same learning effect yeah. or the same cost effectiveness when you use open textbook instead of traditional uh, material. And we can find that a lot. I don't know if that is the right questions. If you always try to compare uh, OER with the uh, classical conventional materials, maybe um, this should not be, um, yeah, yeah, the, the overall leading um, question, um, but, but you can find a lot of studies um, concerning that question. And I think if, if uh, you want to delve deeper into it, um, the case of open textbooks might yeah. be special of interest. Okay. And we, I think we found a lot of studies where they had, for example, experimental settings. They had two courses uh, um, and then they compared uh, by using uh, data analysis. They had an exam and uh, um, compared the outcomes of the students uh, that used uh, open education resources contrasted to those who used uh, commercial materials. So that can be found very often, um, especially in the U US region, as we mentioned okay. before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, uh, one more last comment uh, to uh, get us on the road for more, re to more research on this. What would you uh, like to do next? Uh, us? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what, what we would uh, like to do next is um, to engage more uh, into the debate about um, open educational practices and open pedagogy, because I think these are important aspects that are followed by uh, the question about OER, because um, we can see that OER is primarily content, 
but what we need is uh, pedagogical approaches of how to use it and uh, what can we achieve when we use it, for example, better learning uh, outcomes, for example, uh, different teaching styles, whatever. So we know little about these effects. Um, we have strong conceptual debate about this, uh, for example, Krohn and Boscott, all they, um, all of them provide um, interesting insights, but they don't go so much into the, <laughs> into the em empirical aspects of it. And I think okay. that should be more research about it. Okay, thank you very much, Daniel, Daniel and Nadine. Uh, you can stop recording, please. Thank you very much.